Welcome to our epic ocean, where critical solutions to a planet in peril are brought to the surface. Our epic ocean celebrates all that is epic about the ocean and why it is the planet's most vital resource. And now to our host, Rich Gurman. Welcome to the show, everyone. So my guest today is a former United States Senator who wears many hats. Not only is he an outspoken advocate for the environment, equality, and civil rights, but he continues to lead the charge for ocean energy and climate policy. And he's a former national director for the Surfrider Foundation. He is a longtime surfer, swimmer, and sailor, a true ocean lover. Kevin Ranker, welcome to the show, man. How are you? I'm doing really well, Rich. I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me today. I need to Thanks. clarify that I was, a, I was a Washington State Senator. Ah, okay. Yeah. yeah. That is in the United States. I, you got Washington, yes. you got Washington, D.C. It's, yeah, you get them mixed up. It's all very confusing. So I yeah. really appreciate your time. I know you have so much going on, and I'm excited to dive in deep with you here today. So let's do that. So my first question is, how did a waterman like you find himself – writing policy for climate change, going up against the petroleum industry and all the incredible things that you've been doing. Give us a little backstory. It actually, um, it all started at SACUS at Leo Carrillo State Beach in Northern LA County, where I grew up surfing with my dad and my grandpa and diving the kelp beds offshore. Um, and I realized early on that I wanted to do something that allowed me to stay on the coast. Uh, and so, you know, like, <laughs> like any good, kid growing up on uh, the beaches in North LA County and Zuma and so on. Uh, first, I thought I'd be a pro surfer and that kind of went out the window. Um, but what I realized is it wasn't enough just to be on the coast and enjoy the coast. If I wanted to continue to enjoy it, um, I needed to do something about it. And so I got involved in coastal conservation early on. Um, I ended up being a, um, I was the regional lead for the Surfrider Foundation for all of Washington, Oregon, most Northern California, Alaska, and British Columbia, which mm. was fascinating. Um, and what I realized was we were continually fighting from the outside, trying to get policymakers to do the right thing. And I had an opportunity at one point to, um, uh, a vacancy came up in my local county commission, which if you were in California, that would be equivalent to a county supervisor. Okay. Um, and the woman who was stepping down encouraged me to run. And, and we had this long conversation and she basically said, you know, you're constantly suing us and fighting us to do the right thing. Why don't you just come in and do the right thing? Mm -hmm. And um, what I realized very quickly when I got into politics was that I was able to make a great deal of change. I have also realized, however, that I think you can actually be maybe more effective on the outside um, because you're not caught up in that horrible bureaucracy that is politics. Mm -hmm. um, but I was in politics for 14 years and um, uh, was able to be part of some really remarkable things. And we're going to talk about a lot of those. I, I know you've said that saving the ocean equals saving ourselves. How do we get people to understand this so that they truly begin to take all these serious issues that the planet, the ocean is facing as if their lives depend upon it. Well, I have uh, felt for a long time that as long as they're not on one of my secret spots out here, uh -huh. um, if everybody in the world surfed, uh, I think we'd be a lot better off because I think those of us that surf, and it's the same if you're an avid fisherman, if you're an avid, you know, just an avid waterman, if you're out there, if you're sailing, if you're diving, uh, you have a connection with the ocean that is in your blood, it's in your soul. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think one of the greatest things we can do is make sure that people have some sort of connection to the ocean. Um, and whether that's through, you know, walking on the beach and loving the view or smelling the, the salt in the air, or whether that's, you know, uh, for my generation growing up watching the Jacques Cousteau shows and just being mesmerized by what's going on underneath the surface making that connection with people is critical um, i don't believe it's enough to say that you should protect or fight for the oceans because it's the right thing to do or because it's an environmental argument there needs to be that personal connection there also needs to be a reality check which is you know i mean seven out of ten breaths we take come from the ocean 
um, and its ability to absorb carbons and so on. Um, uh, what is it? Something like 70% of the protein in the world comes from the ocean. I mean, so this is our livelihood. And so the facts, the science, the data, and our passions all need to drive us to that. Mm. So I totally agree. I'm, I guess my question is at the beginning, did you feel like you were pushing this massive boulder up a mountain, needing to educate key decision makers and policy writers on all things ocean health? <laughs> So one time, uh, I think I had been a senator for about a year, and I was at a meeting of the National um, uh, Caucus of State Legislators. Uh, and it's, it, it's the association of all state legislators in the entire country. Okay. And I was making an argument that we should create a coastal caucus. So a entity that would just represent legislators from coastal states. And I stood up and there's, you know, over a thousand people in the room. It was during the General Assembly. And I gave this impassioned speech about how, you know, those of us in Washington State had more in, 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 in common with people in Maine than we did with people from Idaho. And that those of us in coastal states, doesn't matter if you're in Florida or Georgia or New York or California, um, we have similar challenges. And we have similar uh, passions, but we also have similar economic drivers and so on, all related to the ocean. And then I talked about how it was the very beginning of the Obama administration, how the national ocean policy was going to be considered and all this stuff. And this just long, impassioned speech. <laughs> and I'm looking out and people are nodding. And this gentleman, I think he was from Georgia. He stands up. And I, I, I swear to God, he looked like Colonel Sanders. He had this <laughs> kind of white suit thing on. And he said, I think we should do as this young man suggests. <laughs> and then he said, and I further move that he said, I move that we do as this young man suggests. And then he said, and I further move that we make him chair. Because like the rest of you, I'm sure, I have no idea, no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> no idea what he's been talking about. And what struck me, I just had this incredibly depressing aha moment where I looked around the room and nobody, nobody in the room got it. And, I, you know, I was talking about oil spills, preparedness and response. I was talking about fisheries. I was talking about ecosystem based management which that alone is an eye glaze term that nobody yeah. should ever use. Yeah. Um, but I was talking about, you know, the, uh, the land sea connections from snow caps to white caps, you know, and no, no. And, um, and so what struck me is, you know, to your question, I'm still pushing that massive oh. ball uphill. Um, I will say that more people have realized in the last decade, the importance of the ocean. And a lot of it has come from Greta and others pushing the climate agenda further than Al Gore or anybody ever did. Um, and a recognition that if we don't protect our oceans, we're not doing if we if we if we don't make oceans a key argument within the climate agenda, then we're we're missing it. We're totally missing it. The other thing is enough of us who are older are getting the hell out of the way and younger folks who are far more progressive and thoughtful in the way they think of these sorts of things are coming in and taking leadership roles. So I mean, that's a pretty bold statement to make that Greta's made more impact than Al Gore. Was it because she's young? Was it the, her presentation of, of how she speaks? What do you think it is? Yes. <laughs> Both? <laughs> yeah, so, so Al Gore was one of the foremost uh, – voices, one of the more powerful voices in climate change ever, and still is. Um, one of the things uh, I gave, a, I gave a talk at UC Irvine years ago, and I, I remember I, I brought up, I said, I had a slide and I said, Al Gore, the greatest thing for climate action ever. And then the next slide came up and it said, Al Gore, the worst thing for climate action ever. And the reason I said that is because Al Gore added a voice that wasn't there before. He also, unfortunately, just because he had been the previous Democratic vice president of the United States, brought a partisan, and it was nothing he did, 
but it gave opposition mm. the ability to say that is a liberal progressive value instead of let the facts speak for themselves. And unfortunately, you know, within the Republican Party, we need to keep in mind, it was under President Nixon with Republican lawmakers that we created, and many, not all, but many Republican lawmakers, we created the EPA, we created, the, we passed the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the uh, National uh, Pollution uh, Act, the uh, the Marine Mammal Protection Act. I mean, you go down the list of the most important laws in the land, a majority of them, or a good portion of them came out of that era with Republicans leading the charge. And at some point that switched and now, for the most part, and sorry to make it a sweeping statement, I'm not trying to be as blue as my shirt, <laughs> but um, a majority of the Republican Party has been opposed to climate action, and a majority of the Democratic Party has been supportive of climate action for longer. And some of that came out of that Al Gore, Al Gore discussion. And it's really unfortunate. I was lucky enough that Bill Ruckel's house was a very dear friend and one of my greatest mentors in my life. Um, and I worked very closely with him for almost 20 years. And it was remarkable. Um, and it was also wonderful to see this gentleman who had been an absolute statesman working for two Republic. He worked for Nixon and Reagan as EPA director. And he was the first EPA director. And you would talk to him about the environment and it wasn't partisan. It was the right thing to do. It was what you do because it's the right thing to do. That's right. So, I mean, take me deeper into that. Why, why did climate change and ocean acidification become a partisan issue? Is it just the Republicans couldn't let the Democrats be right on it? Like, I don't get it. Like, do they, or maybe the better question is, do the Republicans do the politicians on the right really get the gravity of the situation? And are they turning a blind eye in some selfish attempt to retain power with no care for the future of the planet? <laughs> well, there's a loaded question, Rich. Uh, the, you look, I, I don't want to get too far into broad brush strokes. There mm -hmm. are a lot of Republicans I've worked with who are really not just passionate about these issues, but outspoken advocates on them. Unfortunately, however, the leadership within Congress within the Republican Party, the leadership within many state legislatures within the Republican Party has taken a different position. And I think that position is short sighted and it becomes a jobs argument. And so um, when I was in the Washington State Senate, I passed the first legislation on ocean acidification in the world. Wow. No one had done anything on ocean acidification until we did in Washington State. And I worked very closely with then Governor Chris Gregoire, who was just outspoken out front on this issue. I was able to get the votes to pass my bill, however, not because it was a climate action, but because it was a jobs action. Taylor Shellfish, which is an incredible shellfish provider out of Washington State, Bill Taylor came to me and said, we're going to move hundreds of jobs to Hawaii because the waters here are too acidic. Mm. We have been looking at ocean acidification for a while, not a long while. It was, we were just starting to learn about it, but we, we understood something was going on. It wasn't until that point, however, that I had the political argument I needed to get some big stuff done. And it wasn't because it was bold climate action. And it surely wasn't because it was bold ocean action. It was because I was able to stand up on the Senate floor and say, we are losing hundreds of jobs tomorrow to Hawaii because our waters are acidic. And I didn't get into a big debate of what was causing it. Um, I actually, the senator who was the chair at the time we had a Republican majority, the senator who was the chair of the Environment Committee, um, I had a number of areas in the budget where I had had line items for ocean acidification and he and his staff went through and forced a change and everywhere it said ocean acidification, they took out ocean acidification and put in ocean pH balance mm. because they didn't want it to be perceived as uh, taking a bold position on climate change. 
To which on the Senate floor, I'll never, I remember standing up and saying, I think this is what goes into my deodorant, but okay. <laughs> whatever uh, works, right? Yeah, whatever works. And so my point is, yeah, exactly. Whatever works, whatever you have to say, whatever you have to call it doesn't matter. What matters is that you take the action. And so in the end, it's a jobs argument. And that's the same argument we're making now in Fiji, uh, where I'm doing a lot of work, or in Mexico, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. in the United States, here in the Northwest, in in. Rhode Island, in New York, in Louisiana, they're taking some bold actions. And most of that is around jobs. Because, so, you know, and, and hang on, one other thing to say is, you know, it's, it's ironic, but um, caring about the ocean is a luxury. If you can't feed your kids, if you're worried about keeping a roof over your head, the last thing on your mind is, is the ocean healthy? And, you know, I gave a, I gave a, talk one time actually at UW and it was called, if you can't feed your kids, you don't give a crap about salmon. And it was speaking to a whole bunch of salmon ecologists and scientists and such. And, and that's the reality. And so I used to say in my Senate office, people would come in and they'd say, we want to do all these bold things on the environment. Well, the people who were in my office before that were talking about serious homelessness issues or mental health issues or, um, or public health, you know, and we need to keep in mind that when we're working on the ocean, all of those things are our competition. They're all competition for the politicians because the politicians have to prioritize everything they're talking about, everything they're dealing with. And so you may be really passionate about the ocean, but if you're solely making an, ar an ocean's argument, it is rare that you can push that agenda successfully. It feels like we don't really act upon something until it's like right in our face. And if your priority is... I got to pay my rent. I got to put food on my table. I got to keep my kids safe. Obviously, the ocean's going to take, you know, not even second fiddle. It's going to be, you know, way down the line. So I want to talk about the job conversation. We'll talk about Fiji. We'll talk about Mexico. But take me back to uh, this to Colonel Sanders in Georgia. So we're talking, what, 10, 12 years ago now, right? At least, yeah. So yeah, make, well, maybe, maybe, maybe 12 years, 10 years. Yeah. OK, so you make this talk. You just you pour your heart out and you get the um, cow watching the train go by. And so this is a while ago now. So through your work and, and others, how much awareness has been created at the very top? Like how important are these ocean issues to federal decision makers today versus 10, 12 years ago? I think there's been a sea change. I think there's been a significant change. And, and, and you look at, I mean, when John Kerry was, you know, secretary, he created our ocean. He created a conference that was initiated by the United States and has now been, you know, picked up and, and included nations around the globe, um, working on ocean policy, working on ocean action. Um, uh, we have also seen a uptick in global commitments through the UN. Um, so the UN Sustainable Development Goals right. now have, you know, were developed. And one of those goals is actually a few of those goals are specifically regarding the ocean, but one of them in particular. Um, you also have a number of other countries stepping up. But here in the United States, you have member of members of Congress who are realizing that there has to be a blue agenda. You know, you can't just have the Green New Deal. You got to have a Blue New Deal. Right. You've got to be focused on uh, all of the marine resource issues, um, the marine climate issues, um, but also maritime industry and uh, coastal economies. You know, I, I, I often say, you know, you, you want to protect your marine resources and the communities that depend upon them. Um, and, you know, Chad Nelson, CEO of the Surfrider Foundation, he got his Ph.D. in surf economics, which at the time people thought was hysterical. You know, people were like, what? <laughs> and now mind. people realize, and if you look at, you know, in, in, in San Clemente, California, the toll road uh, association was pushing a toll road that was going to come straight down into trussles. And one of the main uh, key facts that killed that stupid idea for a road going through wasn't that it was going to wipe out the entire water watershed and some of the last steelhead habitat in the entire state of California. But it was it was going to wipe out a surf spot. And then people didn't even care that it was going to wipe out a surf spot until Chad Nelson came in with his doctoral dissertation and said, oh, by the way, here's the millions of dollars a year that this one surf spot brings to the city of San Clemente, the county of Orange and so on the state of California, and people began to realize 
that this was a jobs argument. You know, the people working at the gas station uh, were making money because people were coming to surf trussles. Mm -hmm. The people at, you know, at the uh, San Clemente Cafe, who, by the way, have some of the best omelets out there, you know, were making money because of trussles. And so that entire community's economy and the entire county of Orange is based on surfing, you know. Um, and the other thing is surfers, we're crazy. We go out there year round. You know, we're the, we're the only ones going to the beach in February. Cold water you know? then. Yeah. So, <laughs> anyway. No, I'm with you. In fact, uh, your timing is perfect to bring up Chad. The interview that I did with him launched today. He texted me five minutes before you and I went live here. And um, I guess it was about two weeks ago. I met Chad lives in, in Laguna Beach where yeah. I am. And I got to meet his father, who is just I don't know if you've ever met his dad. His dad yeah, actually lives by you. Yeah. Yeah. His he dad's lives just, on now, but he's a legend from Laguna. Yeah. He is a legend. In fact, the work he did led to the foundation of the Ocean Institute and Dana Point. And yep. uh, there's been some octopuses hanging out in the tide pools right here. So I got to Chad and I've met before, but I got to show his father the octopuses. It was it was a highlight for me. He was he is like you said, he's a true legend. So um, that was cool. So let's talk jobs. I, I remember the movie. Um, it was Vanilla Sky with Tom Cruise, and there was the famous line. He he said his dad told him. He goes, "It doesn't matter what the question is, or no, the, the, the was uh, the answer to ninety nine percent of questions is money." So, as you've been saying in your world of politics, that equates to jobs, jobs, jobs. So, if the government is driven by economic factors, both on a local and federal level, is the messaging where it needs to be? Uh, Sylvia Earle, one of my heroes, has always said, no blue, no green. Are we making an obvious and direct link between the health of the ocean and the health of the economy? Not enough, no. Um, and one of the reasons why is a lot of the money coming from the ocean is coming out of the ocean. It's not because of the ocean. And so um, my work in Fiji, for instance, um, we are really heavily focused on a blue economy and what that means. And what that doesn't mean is continued unsustainable extraction. So if, you're, if, if your vision of jobs from the ocean is massive fishing for tuna, if your vision is it's cheaper to send stuff through massive cargo freighters uh, through the ocean and with all the emissions and everything that comes with it, uh, if your vision is offshore mining Mm -hmm. uh, or oil and gas exploration. Um, those are all massive job creators, but you know, what's an even bigger job creator is something that's actually sustainable. And so, you know, in, in, in Fiji, we're looking at creating, uh, new large marine protected areas that are locally managed. And so there's a fee for going into them and diving and such. Um, uh, you'd pay a fee that fee goes back to the locals so that their local economy is based on a healthy marine ecosystem. Mm. That's a blue economy. Yeah. Uh, oyster cultivation, frankly. Uh, oyster cultivation, particularly if done in, in the right way, is really sustainable and also creates a local mechanism for economic drivers. Um, and so what we need to do is look for what are the opportunities to uh, flourish and thrive as a human community and have that ability to thrive be based on a thriving marine uh, ecosystem. And, um, and we need to pull away from the exhaustive and unsustainable extraction. Um, it's the same with terrestrial, right? I mean, everybody's starting to drive an EV. Why? Well, now because it's trendy and finally automotive makers realize they should just make a really cool car and then make it electric as opposed to the first Honda Insight that looked like a roller skate or something. I don't know. Right. It wasn't practical. Um, but the other reason is because, you know, you're saving money. You're, you know, and, and by the way, on the side, oh, yeah, you're doing something good for the environment. Um, we need to make those same sorts of arguments for the ocean. Like, let's do what's fun. Let's do what's right. And then, oh, it happens to be it's really good for the environment. If we just come out with the pro-ocean, pro-environment message soul, solely up front, I think we lose because the majority of the people don't have the luxury, again, yeah. to to have solely that position. Hmm. Okay, so we can improve the messaging. I want to I go to Fiji. We'll, we'll talk international, but... 
a couple things I want to talk about here in the U.S. first. Mainly yeah. You brought him up. So you served under Obama, as you mentioned, on, it was the National Ocean Council. What was the purpose and the impact of that council? And what was it like to work with Obama? Uh, so I only met Obama three times. So I, I, I used to tell people when I had that. Three times more than I met him, Kevin. <laughs> uh it was not like I was hanging out with the guy. Okay. I, I used to tell people I advised the people who advised the president. Um, and so and I was an advisor to the National Ocean Council um, on a and it was a it was a formal White House appointment. Mm -hmm. um, but it was while I was a state senator and I was representing on this small group of people. There was 18 of us from around the country and I was representing all of the state legislators in the country. And so I literally would go check in with people and have conversations like, hey, here's what we're talking about. What do you think? Um, and that was fascinating. I will tell you that not from my personal interactions with the president because they were so few and very short, um, but from the wonderful relationships I built with people who actually were working very closely with him. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we've ever or will we ever have uh, a president with more integrity uh, and more vision mm -hmm. than President Obama. He and, and, and frankly, sometimes that trips you up as a politician, because when you have vision and, and integrity, you want to discuss things thoroughly and so on. And, and a lot of politicians want to work off a bumper sticker. Um, so that makes it tough. Um, but the National Ocean Council came out of the executive order that he signed for a national ocean policy. And it was the first time in U.S. history that we had a national ocean policy and only the second time in U.S. history. The first time again back the Stratton Commission back under coming out of the Nixon era and around that period was uh, looking at comprehensive kind of what do we do as a country on our oceans. Um, and the National Ocean Council was stood up to implement his national ocean policy, President Obama's national ocean policy. And that national ocean policy looked at marine spatial planning. It looked at conservation. It looked at energy and so on. And my role was to advise the people who were putting that together. And it was fascinating. I did that for seven years mm. uh, with regular meetings at the White House and with some just incredible people from around the country, both on the on the advisory body that I served on, as well as working on the National Ocean Council itself. Um, and at the time, I mean, remember, we also had, you know, Jane Lubchenco, who's one of the foremost scientists out there on the ocean, had just been appointed the, you know, the uh, undersecretary for NOAA. Um, we had uh, Lisa Jackson at EPA. We had just some really brilliant, um, mostly women, because they're smarter than we are, um, <laughs> leading these discussions. And it was a fascinating and exciting time. I will say, um, uh, I actually, so years ago, I gave a talk to a bunch of Marine funders and I believe our mutual friend Beto was there and some yeah. others, uh, from Marisa foundation. And, uh, my first slide, I put up a picture of Napoleon dynamite and the U S commission on ocean policy. <laughs> and everybody was kind of like, where the hell is he going with this? And I talked about how, uh, all the funders in the room, I was talking to this group of Marine foundations or funders. And, and I said, all of you spent, you know, I don't remember the amount, but millions and millions of dollars making sure that the U S commission on ocean policy and the Pew oceans commission were bold and thoughtful in their actions and came up with a report and final rec recommendations that were bold and would actually do something. And then I said, and then we all celebrated. And then we woke up one day and went, Oh my God, the, uh, the goal was not to come out with a report and recommendations. The goal was to implement them. And too often we get, first of all, we let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And secondly, we, we spend all this time coming up with great recommendations and reports. And then we don't spend as much time or any time actually looking at implementing those. Um, so I put up the slide and I told that story of the U.S. Commission and the Pew Oceans Commission. And then I said, by contrast, the film Napoleon Dynamite took, and I don't remember the numbers exactly, but I said, the producers spent something like $230,000 making the entire film. And then they spent millions of dollars promoting it. By contrast, Napoleon Dynamite grossed several million, tens of millions of dollars in the first weekend upon release because they spent time telling people what they were doing. And so too often mm -hmm. we get caught up doing what we're doing and we don't spend time telling people what we're doing and why it's important. And so 
at my time when I was working with the National Ocean Council and folks in that community, um, it was difficult because we got really caught up in minutia. I remember I did a report for uh, some funders actually back then um, with two colleagues of mine, and we went around and we interviewed 112 members of Congress, governors, uh, and industry leaders in the maritime industry or in the ocean scene. Um, so heads of huge shipping companies, head of West Marine, you know, whatever. Um, and we presented this report and it was very closed door. Uh, you know, no one was supposed to hear. And it was, it was depressing because it wasn't depressing because the actions that were being discussed by the White House weren't incredible. It was depressing because nobody knew about it. Mm. Of the 112 serious movers and shakers in the United States on ocean issues, we went to like the head of the ocean's caucus in the Congress, you know, and, and, uh, and folks, some folks knew about it and, and had a negative perception because of how it had been rolled out and maybe it wasn't politically sensitive or one thing or another. And so there was some turf issues, but a super majority of the people we talked to didn't even know about it. Or if they did, they knew very little. And most of it was totally uneducated. Like they had the wrong idea of what it was. And so um, a lot of the seven years working on that was uphill battles to try and educate people. Again, bring it back to a local jobs argument and so on. But also um, the opposition sure knew about it hmm. and they were organized. I mean, they had the 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 domain name for national ocean policy before we had even written it, um, and uh, and the oil industry and others saw this as a a way to stop them from leasing uh, bottomlands, and so the folks who did know about it knew uh, did know about it were very well organized, but a majority of the folks who needed to make decisions to help us implement the policy were unaware. Why didn't they know uh, about it? Well, part of it is it, it wasn't anything to do with how the administration rolled it out. It wasn't their priority. You know, I mean, we're in a bubble, Rich. Yeah. You and I and a handful of other people talking about things like oceans and, and oh my God, and you want to go deeper, go back into ecosystem-based management or coastal and marine spatial planning. I mean, um, you know, and then, and then the opposition has a bumper sticker that says, I won't raise your taxes. Yeah. That's it. That's that's all you get, right? And so I'm over here, blah, 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 just for minutes at a time trying to explain something. And the next guy stands up and says, taxes suck. I like fishing. Yeah. So, um, and and so, the, you know, in all, in all seriousness, I have, a, I have a lot of friends in Congress and um, most of them care deeply about ocean issues. Um, but it's hard to make that a real priority. Because there's always something else from education to funding for, again, mental health or whatever else, right? Housing. Um, those issues, you know what it is? It's, do you remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Sure. You know, so it's that pyramid and you want to become self-actualized as a human being, which is like Yoda floating on a cloud. Yeah. And, you know, but you can't achieve one step until you achieve the step before that. And the very first step is food and water. That's right. The next yeah. step after that is shelter. Right. Well, if you don't have food and water and you don't have shelter or your constituents don't have food and water and don't have shelter, it's hard to get them to come in and say, oh, my gosh, the most important thing I can do is create a marine protected area. Yeah. It's hard to focus on enlightenment when you're starving to death. Totally. Yeah. So I would imagine after seven, eight years of that council, a lot of that good work, even though that was a challenge, too, was undone the four years after. We seem to be fortunate to have Biden in office right now, who is obviously on our side with a lot of these things. Have you are you seeing a lot of momentum being built right now? I'm seeing a lot of clawback. Um, your first point can't be underscored enough. I mean, there were seven executive orders that I uh, was I was advising people who were working on those sorts of things, everything from the National Arctic policy to the ocean policy to some other different actions on leasing and so on, uh, creating national marine monuments. Um, and of the seven, five of them were repealed outright and, and the other two were weakened, we'll say. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I think 
the new administration and a majority of Americans who are passionate and engaged in ocean issues are in a, frankly, a fight to say me first, as far as I want my thing that was taken back, put back on first. Because there's so many things that were devastated over the last four years that it's going to take a while for us just to get back to where we were, right. let alone taking proactive actions in the other direction. I will say, however, if you look at the Biden appointments for uh, key positions on climate change in the oceans, um, uh, he and the vice president are making some really exciting appointments. Um, and, you know, another one that people don't think as much about the land sea connections, but the Department of Interior has a significant impact on our oceans through monuments and other areas as well, but also through those land sea connections. And if you look at the new Secretary of the Interior, I mean, I literally teared up when I heard she was going to be appointed because it is it is a it is as powerful as an appointment as as anyone could imagine if you care about the environment and you care about oceans and and the same is holding true on climate and on direct ocean positions as well. But John just, Kerry. So yeah, so I believe that um, we are in a situation where we're still trying to put back the pieces of the puzzle that was blowing up. But in the very near term, we're going, to go, we're going to begin to see some really bold steps being taken out of that. And I will also say that, you know, on his first day in office and on his, in his first month in office, the number of executive orders that uh, President Biden signed to not only crush some of the naive decisions that were made in the previous four years, but to really take bold actions in the right direction was unprecedented. It was it was really exciting. So you feel hopeful. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. I'm Good. very hopeful. I'm also hopeful that um, one of the things that America lost that I hope we can regain is our international reputation. Um, but one of the things that came out of that was really positive was a number of countries stepped up to fill the void. I mean, even China. Uh, Japan, uh, the European Union, uh, the UK, um, smaller uh, developing states like Fiji, the Marshall Islands, uh, Vuluatu and others in the Pacific have really stepped up. And so while America was destroying our reputation and backing out of international agreements and so on, other countries began to step up. Mexico, Mexico is doing incredible work. Mexico's um, Senate, by the way, in their last election, they went 54% women and about 65% with their progressive party. And they're discussing some bold actions. Now, there have been some turn back. So if some of your viewers start to question, yes, there's been some things recently on, uh, particularly with petroleum use and, and uh, vision in the country in the with the AMLO administration. But I will say, there's also a lot of just incredible work being done in Mexico, just to our South, that we should learn from. And we should stop being as arrogant as we are as a country and realize that some other countries have some really big, incredible ideas that we could learn from. That's a that's a really good to hear. In fact, as you and I know, the ocean has no border, so definitely no visible border. And it's very hard to govern this open, massive sea. So let's let's go international a little deeper there. You were confirmed as senior advisor for the blue economy, oceans and climate to Fiji, as you mentioned. And you're also, I believe, consulting the Mexican government on creating legislation around single-use plastics, ocean acidification, and this Mexican Green New Deal. Yeah. Uh, tell us more about that. Anything you want, Fiji-related or the Mexican Green Deal. And I guess the, the bigger question is, how do we work together internationally, knowing that there is no border to the ocean, to solve the problems that we face as this global community? Yeah, so... Let me uh, start with Mexico. So I am uh, advising a member of Congress in Mexico and then one governor in Mexico on a number of aspects of, like you said, looking at um, how do you how do you advance some of the more progressive legislation in the world on plastics to really eliminate single use plastics and polystyrene? How do you look at marine conservation in a way that, again, uh, engages locals and their economic drivers in the conservation preservation argument. How do you create a national ocean policy that's even better than the one the United States did? 
And these discussions are happening right now in Mexico. And what's come out of that is um, a member of, uh, of uh, their Congress that I'm working with is now, uh, and it, you know, I don't want to call it a Green New Deal, but we don't have a new name for it. But Green New Deal is an American idea. What, what, what we are putting together is the idea of a Mexican platform that would be a green platform, a green and blue pat platform. So some of the strongest legislation on plastics, on climate action, on neutrality, on energy efficiency and renewable energy, on ocean acidification, on direct conservation. Um, the idea of creating a uh, climate conservation core or a civilian conservation core where you set up workforce development pro programs, paid programs where people get good wages, to learn the skill sets to do conservation and restoration, and then they get hired by the government to go out and do that work, modeled after the U.S. Um, Civilian Conservation Corps during the Great Depression, where instead of giving people a handout, we gave people a job that they were proud of. Um, and those jobs ended up really benefiting the environment and the communities that depended upon that environment. And so we're looking at all of that in Mexico at once, and it's really exciting. Um, in one state particularly, we're also looking at how do we incentivize a blue and green economy? How do we incentivize corporations to truly be triple bottom line? So instead of just profit, it's profit, people, planet. And how do we force companies? So part of it is how do you incentivize? And some, so it's carrot and hammer, right? And then some of it is how do you really push them to do that? Um, and how do you make sure that you know all exports are 100% organic, uh, shade growing, and so on, so that it's good and, 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 and fair trade, so that the people are getting good wages, but there's also a benefit to the environment and so on. That's all happening in Mexico. And, and like I said, you know, we as Americans, we often, particularly looking south, because not only are we are arrogant, but we're racist, <laughs> um, we, we don't understand the incredible ideas that are coming out of Mexico. And part of the reason we don't understand is we don't pay attention. Uh, and part of it is that we just don't listen. Um, uh, but there's some remarkable things going on down there. It's um, really good to hear. Big ideas. Yeah, we've been trained in this country to really not think anything good about what's going on south of the border. So that, that's very encouraging to hear. In, in your experience, what, what works better? Is it the carrot or is it the stick? I think it has to be a combination. You know, you've got to come in and say, hey, look, we really want to help you do the right thing. And if you don't, there's a hammer. Okay. Um, and, you know, and we've also seen in the United States, there's a number of companies that haven't done the right thing who have paid the price. Um, you know, there's a number of corporations who got caught up supporting the um, concentration camps we were setting up for children being separated from their families. And they saw an immediate hit in their profit. And so when they didn't think about a triple bottom line, their singular bottom line got impacted by several points. Um, and so there's a true economic gain or loss associated with these sorts of issues. And one of the other things that gives me hope, and it is entirely because of people younger than us, that social media as a platform has become so strong that um, no, no longer can you get away with being the evil corporation that screws over a community because somebody will tweet it, somebody will put it on Snapchat, somebody will put it on you know, Instagram, and it will go viral. And, and we've seen this time and time again with corporations who have been slammed because of this. And it's funny, at first they'll say, oh, it's just on, you know, it's just on Twitter, who cares? And then the next day it's on the cover of the New York Times. So when do you start caring? Well, you start caring when your, you know, your portfolio goes down significantly. Uh, when your shares go down significantly. Um, and so I think we're seeing that, uh, frankly, on both sides of the border. And, 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 and it gives me hope that there's opportunity there. That's good. For, for continued change. That's good. That's good. We need more hope. In fact, the reason when I look back at why I created this, this podcast, as, as you know, I, I have a very deep love for the ocean, specifically the, the marine animals, dolphins and whales. And I just, I was like, I need to be talking to people like you that are in the trenches focused on solutions for my own hope and for the hope of anyone that watches. So let's dive in, if we can, to some specific uh, solution areas. One we touched on a little bit already, just overall protection of the ocean. So obviously there's fish populations that need to be restored. 
There's fishing nets in the ocean, which is a huge problem. Noise pollution, massive shipping vessels are killing whales who are not only sacred animals, but an important piece of the carbon drawdown equation, coral reefs, reefs being bleached, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I believe that we need a global network of no take zones. Um, one big initiative right now is 30 by 30. Tell me about 30 by 30 and is 30% enough. Why not protect more? Well, considering um, that I was part of the campaign, what, 15 years ago called less than 1% is not enough. I'm glad <laughs> that now we're talking about 30. Um, uh, we're still nowhere near that. But literally, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, when I was still with Surfrider Foundation, we were part of a, a, a coalition that came together looking at uh, creating marine protected areas from California to Alaska. Um, and back then, less than 1% of all U.S. territorial waters was protected in any way, shape, or form. Um, and, and I will say that that initiative, when it, when it ended, we didn't realize the success that, or the momentum we had built. But out of that came Marine Protected Areas in Oregon and the Marine Life Protection Act in California. Not exclusively because of that coalition, but because of the work that was done there. Um, so 30 percent great should we be talking about more absolutely but really what we should be talking about is not lines on a map we should be talking about a character change a fundamental change in how we think about the oceans it can no longer be that extraction is okay it can't it shouldn't be that when i look out i'm looking out at the water right here in deer harbor on orcas island when i look out at the water i my, my thoughts should not be oh i wonder how many salmon i should catch it should be, you know, uh, how, how beautiful the wildlife is and how I protect it. And, uh, you know, I mean, my daughter, that's her mentality. She's 13. That's all she thinks mm -hmm. is, you know, that we've got to protect the ocean. So there needs to be a real uh, fundamental change in how we think about the oceans uh, away from extraction. And so I would push us to, yes, we need more fully protected areas because that that sea change isn't happening quick enough and it won't happen quick enough uh, and so we need that regulatory arm at the same time uh, back to the previous conversation like with the work i'm doing in fiji um, if we can create economic drivers that fully depend upon a healthy marine ecosystem that's even more valuable than saying it's fully protected because the other thing we found and particularly in the south pacific is there's a lack of enforcement so we create these protected areas and then we don't necessarily enforce them. Um, the other thing is a colleague of mine in Fiji, he said something to me one of the first times we met, which is why I wanted to work with him and work on this whole initiative we're doing now down there now. Um, he said, the greatest threat to ocean conservation is poverty. The greatest threat to ocean conservation is poverty. And he went on to tell me how there was a great success story in this marine protected area. Well, when Hurricane Winston hit and tourism was, you know, majority of the economy, tourism was gone. Um, people needed to feed themselves. They knew where the big fish were. They were in that protected area. Let's go hammer it. That's right. Same thing with COVID. When tourism went out the door, when they shut the borders appropriately, um, uh, what happened? Well, we're going to, I mean, it goes back to the same thing as Maslow's hierarchy of need again, right? And so is 30 by 30 enough? I think 30 by 30 is really exciting and I hope we can achieve that. And for me, that's, that's a beginning of the conversation. So it's helping people rise. I, I, yeah. One of the common threads that I've learned from everyone that I've interviewed is that at the end of the day, it boils down to an elevation of consciousness that needs to occur. And what I'm hearing from you is it's a step below that, which is helping people rise out of poverty so they can even think about these things um, on a mass scale. I, does that sound about right? Absolutely. Absolutely it is. I mean, look, we are privileged. Uh, I mean, we're privileged because we're white men. Uh, but we're also privileged because of where we grew up and the lifestyle we have. And if we are going to get, even across the United States, uh, more consciousness, more awareness, more engagement, and more passion about the oceans, we've got to 
we've got to raise communities in a way so that everybody has the luxury to enjoy the oceans or at least care about their natural environment, whatever it may be. Um, and that's why the issues of, you know, I've done a lot of work on climate change, uh, both while I was in politics and since leaving. And the racial justice issues, the environmental justice issues associated with climate change. I mean, for the most part, I mean, you go back, the, the environmental movement in the United States has been a uh, very white agenda. Um, and we have not considered the fact that, I mean, look, you're not building coal powered facilities in Bel Air and you're not building them in, in, you know, downtown Seattle or Bellevue. They're in lower income communities uh, here in the Northwest. Some of the greatest environmental injustices have been in Indian country in our either in or adjacent to Native American reservations. Um, I should also point out, however, some of the greatest environmental victories in this country's history came from Indian country. From blocking pipelines to blocking the single largest coal export facility in the world to uh, marine conservation. Uh, it's, it's Indian country, it's, it's individuals who are more enlightened than us and they're thinking seven generations behind and seven generations forward for their, for their decisions um, who are taking some of these actions. But back to that environmental justice and frankly environmental racism, we need to as a country realize that those of us who really want to do something by the oceans or for the environment, for the earth, we need to realize that part of that needs to be a recognition of the impacts to certain communities and how much greater those impacts have been than any, anything we've experienced. Um, yourself, Chad, myself, we all got to grow up on the beach, like spending incredible afternoons. Oh, yeah. uh, in my first career, I was a high school counselor responsible for uh, high-risk high youth in Los Angeles County. And I'll never forget, I was um, at uh, Normandy uh, in South Central. Uh, I, I was working with a number of students from the South Central Los Angeles area. And they're, what, 10 miles from the coast? They'd never been to the beach. Never. There was a big white wall blocking them, right? Mm. Um, so these issues of race and justice, income inequality, they are all environmental discussions. And if we want to be successful in protecting the ocean, we had better wake up to the injustices that have taken place and how we correct those and how we take a look at ourselves and our privilege in, in that as part of that discussion. I'm really glad you brought this up. And I think as painful as the last 12 months have been for a lot of people, all these issues seem to be coming to the surface and we're having the conversation. So that's, that's gotta be a good thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. There was a wonderful, uh, black lives matter, uh, rally here on the, in the little community where I live. And this young woman, she must've been 16 and she stood up in the beginning and she said, our job here is to have a conversation that makes all of you very uncomfortable. <laughs> And all of us were like, whoa, OK, here we go. Um, but you know what? She was right and spot on. And frankly, the more uncomfortable we are with having some of these conversations, the better it is because we're questioning our own you know, privilege and we're also questioning what we think of as the norms. And so, yes, Rich, you're, you are exactly correct. The fact that we're having these conversations should give us hope. But we also need to realize that we need to move beyond protests, move beyond rallies, move beyond conversations, and turn all of that into action, both in our personal daily lives and in the actions that we take through whatever means we have. I love that. I love the consistency of your message, because every time I ever talk to you or communicate with you, you talk about action and implementation, right? The first time we talked about my Blue City project, you're like, sounds great, but what about implementation? What about implementation? So I like well, way to stay on point, man. I appreciate that. So let, I'm a one trick pony. <laughs> that, that's, it's the right trick, though. It's good. So um, let's talk a little bit more about fishing in from the conversations I've had even just with friends, it seems like the main pushback on 30 by 30 is from fishermen because telling people they can't fish, 
telling them they can't go enjoy their favorite form of recreation probably feels like they're being stripped of their freedoms. Yet you and I both know that in many cases, well, I'll, I'll, I'll throw it as a question to you. Are, are we truly fishing out the ocean or is this uh, a, a untrue talking point? No, we are fishing out the ocean. I mean, we're also fishing down the food chain. I mean, you know, the charismatic megafauna in the ocean are gone or are mostly gone. And, and it frustrates me when I have really dear friends who are fairly engaged, I'll put it that way, in the recreational fishing industry as an industry. I am an avid recreational fisherman. I go fishing whenever I can, although um, I, I don't go spear fishing anymore, which is kind of sad because I can't spear and release. Um, but I, I try and release almost all of what I catch. Uh, and um, that said, uh, if we don't, again, take a look at our personal actions, we're going to we're going to love it to death. Um, and while commercial fishing is more of an impact to think that recreational fishing doesn't have an impact is naive at best. Um, and so we need to, um, it, it's hard, Rich. You, you want to have an educated conversation with people, but some people won't, they can't hear you. You know, it's, it's too personal for them. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They just hear, oh wait, I can't fish. Yep. And that's the end of the conversation. Yeah. And it may be that you can't fish there, but you can fish right next to it. You know, when we were doing the Marine Life Protection Act there, and I say we loosely, I was mainly working in the Northwest by that point. Okay. Um, uh, but there was a lot of fishermen who were kind of saying, oh, my God, you're shutting down my very favorite place. Uh, and, and I, as a fisherman, would laugh. I'd be like, look, I, I, I fish the backside of Anacapa, too. And guess what? Yes, that point is good, but so is the next one, and so is the next one. And I've seen your boat there when I'm there, so shut up, right? <laughs> um, the other thing is fishing the line. You create a marine protected area that's fully no-take zone. We know that the fish get bigger, and they start to go outside, and then you can catch them, right? So there's all sorts of opportunities. In the end, it comes back to something that Bill Ruckelshaus said to me years ago. I um, uh, was doing kind of an interview like this, but on a stage, both of us sitting on stools, you know, with a bunch of people watching and, um, somebody was appalled at his positions on some land use issues that had come up in the conversation. Um, and they were questioning his true conservatism and so on. And when it got to the Q and A at the end, and this person asked him this question and he just looked out at them and he said, look, when I was born, there was 3 billion people on this entire planet. He said, in my lifetime, we've nearly tripled that. And he said, there's just too many of us. You can't continue to do the same thing the same way and expect the same result. It's not going to happen. And so the hard reality of some of these conversations is we can't continue to do the same thing. I have a photo and I wish I could find it actually, but there's a photo of me as a kid. My dad and grandpa and I went spearfishing off of Santa Barbara Island. And it's a photo of me on the back deck of this boat. And I am surrounded by fish that I speared. I mean, 30, 40 fish, you know, like, were we going to eat that many? No, we gave them to other people on the boat and stuff. And um, I didn't, I didn't have an understanding that that just wasn't okay. I mean, and everybody on the boat was sharing them was our idea. So it was okay. But, um, when I, I saw that photo maybe 10 years ago, I found it in a box and I was just appalled. I was like, Oh my God, I was naive. And now I've learned more. Um, so just like climate change, just like ocean conservation, generally, uh, carbon sequestration issues. I mean, there's, you know, Waikiki, everybody started going to Waikiki in the early 1900s and one of the biggest draws was watching the surfers and so the hotels got closer and closer to the beach until finally when there was storm surge they were so close they would get flooded so then they built this big seawall and so then the sand starts to erode and the surfing gets less good right in front of those hotels and now if you go to that same area there's a cement seawall with a cement walk path and there's almost no beach there you know and so we've learned right um and the hard thing is when those lessons we learn are contrary to our uh, personal economics mm -hmm. or our personal, what we believe is a right. So it is not a right 
to get to fish anywhere you want as much as you want. Um, it's, it's something that we should cherish and protect. Um, but we just need to do it in a way that is sustainable. And so maybe it's releasing more fish. Maybe it's some areas you don't get to fish. Um, but we've got to have those discussions and we've also got to be willing to stop with the stupid, you know, John Kerry, when he was running, I remember there was this photo of him supposedly duck hunting and he wasn't even carrying the rifle right and so on. And so a lot of people saw through it and just saw him as kind of elitist trying to act like he cared about natural resource recreation and so on. Um, uh, which is, is not the case. He's, he's actually an avid outdoors person, but, um, the point is too often, you know, the people on the docks who, you know, they get a weekend off and they want to go out of, you know, Santa Barbara and go fishing out in the Channel Islands. And that's their one lovely thing they get to do. We need to recognize how important that is to people too, and talk to them at their level and not come in thinking that we're so much smarter. You're bringing up some great points. In fact, I wish we had another hour just to talk about all things fishing, because in my mind, if I, if I had my way, the entire coast of California would be a marine sanctuary for the sake of protecting the coastline. And also the coast is the most valuable asset we have, going back to what you're saying about economy. Um, so we could have a whole conversation on MPA versus no take. In my mind, if you can still fish and drill for oil in an, NL, in an MPA, like, I don't really see the point. I was going to say, then how protected is it? It's really, it's not, but that's what's happening. And then I get the other side, you know, if we tell a, a recreational fisherman that he or she can't go fish, they're going to be pissed. So in my mind, it really, the answer lies more in restricting commercial fishing practices. But you just said a minute ago, it's, you know, residential fishing has an impact also. And to find, to be honest, Kevin, I find it interesting to hear your take on this as someone you know, it wouldn't be surprising if you said nobody should eat fish. Nobody should fish. We need to let these fish stocks come back to protect the planet and for the fish. But you're not saying that. You you still like to fish. So I guess we'll, we'll move on in a second. But how do we, um, yeah, my mind's kind of spinning with just thoughts now. How do we create this balance, this sustainability that you're talking about? Because some would say there's no such thing as sustainable fishing. Well, unfortunately, we have a hard time defining what sustainable fishing is because too many times we say something is sustainable and then we realize it's not. To your previous point on just don't eat fish, I mean, Mark Spalding, the CEO of the Ocean Foundation, who is a dear friend and mentor of mine, will go out to dinner and he'll say, you know, they'll say, I've got this great special on salmon or something. And he just says, I don't eat my clients. <laughs> um, so he won't eat fish for that reason and good on him. Uh, that's also a luxury. Uh, you know, if, if a super majority of the world's proteins come from the ocean, we can't just say don't eat fish to everybody. So again, that's a privileged position. Yeah. Um, now for me, I'm privileged and I choose to eat fish and I love it. I also, I haven't had coho or king salmon in, I mean, uh, uh, in many years because they're so depleted and they are almost the exclusive food source for the southern resident orca whale. So if I want the orca whale to survive, I need to stop eating their food. Um, I wish more people would do that. You can still eat salmon. Um, uh, you should not eat farmed salmon, um, which is horrible for the environment. I mean, there's, you know, these net pen, net pen aquaculture should be banned in the entire country, period, full stop. It's the worst thing for the oceans. It's just horrible. Um, we could have a whole conversation on that. Um, the reason I bring this up, though, is that, you know, uh, it's, it, yes, it's an educational point uh, that w we need to educate more people. We also need to recognize that uh, some people don't have an option. Um, but the biggest thing is we need to educate ourselves. So if I'm going to choose to eat fish, I need to spend the time to know what I'm buying. It's, it's, it's sad, but the local grocery store here on Orcas Island, it's really hard to get local wild fish. A, a, a good portion of the fish here is farmed Atlantic salmon, and we're in the northwest, right? Wow. Um, and then you can get Alaskan salmon, but you can't get local salmon as easy. And the Lummi Nation has a very sustainable, incredible fishery, um, but it's hard to get the fish, right? And so... Um, Unfortunately, we have a Walmart mentality where we want to just go into one place and get everything. And again, back to Bill Ruckelshaus's point, you can't do the same thing the same time, the same way and expect the same result. Well, 
we are in a place now where we're going to need to spend more time educating ourselves on where our fish came from. And thank God for Julie Packard and the Monterey Bay Aquarium doing the first Seafood Watch program. And now there's others out there. But you can get an app on your phone. So when you go for sushi, you can see, oh, is what I'm ordering actually sustainably caught? And there's some flaws with that every once in a while because they can't keep up with the changes, right? But the point is, we need to do a better job of educating ourselves and taking the time to teach ourselves and also just taking the time to make those decisions. It's not okay to go into the grocery store if you have the luxury to do so and just say, oh, that's what's available, so I'm buying it. It may be that you decide, oh, I'm not going to eat salmon tonight because all I can get is farmed and I know that's horrible. Um, which also leads me to a whole another discussion, which would take another two interviews, <laughs> which is the conversation about beef and the cultivation of beef and the impact on the oceans from cows, yes. um, which, is, which is worse than any fishery. So, I mean, <laughs> I'm not suggesting nor do I want to go vegan, no. but uh, my hat's off for those, uh, uh, or at least vegetarian, my hat's off to those who do because there's the true ocean champions. But again, it's a luxury. So let's create mechanisms, let's create economic drivers, let's create community structures that are based around sustainability for not just our oceans, but the people, but recognizing the connection between the land and the sea, us as humans and the sea, and how important that is. Um, and I think that's how we get there. And, and is that an ecotopia? Maybe, but you know what? If I'm gonna be hopeful, if I'm gonna be passionate, I wanna dream big. It's the only way, and I don't think it's, to me, it's like we no longer have the luxury of time on these issues, right? This is an all hands on deck moment. Yeah. So dreaming big might be equivalent in my mind to our survival as a species, as our way to live in harmony with the planet, right? Yeah. So, wow. It was funny because uh, when I was preparing for this, I was like, I have enough questions where Kevin and I could spend about a three a, long, a holiday weekend together talking about these issues and I want to be respectful to your schedule so I have a bunch of other solution areas I wanted to cover I'm going to throw them all at you at once and let you kind of pinpoint what you want to talk about here in the last few minutes we have so um, the first thing was protecting the ocean the next issue to me is the an energy revolution that is occurring uh, phasing out fossil fuels replacing them with renewals uh, renewables you mentioned beef so uh, to me the the third thing is the food revolution where if humans switch to more of a plant-based diet that's going to reduce deforestation our need for grazing land need for water etc um, and then the next issue i wanted to bring up was rewilding the world right just encouraging more nature in the ocean on land in our cities planting more trees mangroves sea grease, kelp coral reefs etc and then lastly would be a material revolution, which is shifting away from non-toxic or from toxic materials like plastic to new non-toxic materials. So which of those do you want to tackle for a couple of minutes, Kevin? Jeez. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go backwards. Rewilding the world. So don't waste a crisis is something I've said a lot over the last year and a half. And one of the wonderful things that came out of COVID was the fact that we were locked down and we couldn't go to Disneyland. <laughs> More people went outdoors because they could. Um, while the beaches were closed off and on in California, ours weren't. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and for the most part, you could still go outdoors. And so when people had no other options, they got back to camping. You know, uh, outdoor retailers like REI had just this incredible blitz of people like, oh, I want to go camping. And then, you know, this winter up at Mount Baker at my mountain, you know, it was like everybody was like, oh, I'm not just going to Baker. I want to be backcountry Bob and like <laughs> learn it all overnight, which is also dangerous. But um, the uh, the thing was that more people got reintroduced to the wild and the benefits of being outdoors and thoroughly appreciating the outdoors. And so that's exciting. You mentioned mangroves and seagrasses. Um, so 30% of the ocean's ability to absorb carbon. So 70% of the ocean's ability, 70% of the oxygen in the earth comes from the ocean. Of that, 30% approximately is from seagrasses or mangroves in that near shore environment. So the near shore environment is critical. That's right. um, and, uh, and restoring seagrass beds and mangroves uh, is also critical, uh, again, for human health, but also for fisheries, going back to our previous conversation. 
these are the uh, areas where the forage fish, which are not called forage fish because they forage, they're foraged upon. Mm. And they're often in the mangroves and in the seagrasses, but so are the juvenile grouper, the juvenile tuna, the juvenile salmon use these areas. Um, the other thing though, is that these are the natural protections to storms, the same storms that are happening stronger and more frequently than ever before. And so in the Pacific Islands to Florida, you know, if you wipe out all the mangroves because you want a beach without mangroves in front of it, and then you're curious of why the hurricane just slammed and took out your entire establishment, well, guess what? That whole mangrove you took out was the natural seawall, which does a lot better than a man-made seawall. So there's all these benefits to that. And so we just need to also think about how we work with the ecosystem that we're part of as opposed to trying to manipulate it because we never get it right. Um, so on rewilding the world, I think it's an educational opportunity for us to look at the economic benefits. I mean, look, FEMA and National Insurance Companies Associations, uh, all of them are now starting to say, wow, maybe we shouldn't continue to insure the house that's built in a stupid place that keeps getting flooded because they wiped out the entire natural protection. Um, so there's all these economic values, there's cultural values and so on. The other piece is um, on the energy revolution. Look, I live in a small archipelago off the northwest coast. Uh, it's almost the same size as the Orkney Islands off of Scotland. Scotland's Orkney Islands are 110% renewable energy, mm. primarily from wind, solar, tidal, um, some geothermal. Um, and so it can be done. Now, you can't necessarily go 100% without some sort of equalizer, something to help out everywhere. But we can do way better than we are, and we should be 100% off coal. There should be no coal-fired power plants in the country anymore. Those should be rotated out as quickly as possible. We should be shutting them down and repurposing them. Uh, but we should be doing dramatic expansion of renewable energy, and that has to include ocean energy, too. We have to start talking more seriously about offshore wind, and the Biden administration just put forward a proposal saying that they want to start moving in that direction. Um, and, and so are there impacts associated with that? You betcha. Are they significant enough that we should turn the other way? Absolutely not. And so looking at offshore wind, particularly deep water floating offshore wind, where we know the winds are sustainable. Look, you go off the coast of Washington 30 miles, I don't care if it's August or February, there's wind. It's pretty significant. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, whereas right on shore, maybe there isn't as regularly. And so, but that technology is there now and it's working. Um, solar as well. Um, and so on the energy revolution, it's huge. And the last thing I touch upon is the food revolution. Um, for those of us who are privileged, we can choose to eat the way I get to eat, which is a majority of my food actually comes from these islands. You know, I, I, I love a good burger. Um, I absolutely love a good burger. I'm proud that my beef primarily comes from Lopez and from Orcas, or, or from, if not from Skagit, so close by. Um, but again, that's a luxury. Um, that's a luxury that most people don't have. And so how do we deal with that in a way that is equitable um, and not shameful, too? I don't get to drive down the street and say, oh, my God, you, you know, you get your beef from Walmart and it's from a cattle farm in Idaho or what, you know, that's not an option. Um, and so I think along with a food revolution needs to come that it goes, you know what, it goes full circle. It's all about equity and justice. You know, if we truly want to save the world, we need to rise all people. We need to be equitable and just and make sure that um, kids in South Central Los Angeles or kids in Alabama or kids in Fiji or Mexico all have the opportunity to eat sustainably. And, and shame on us if we think we have the right to condemn anybody who doesn't when we haven't helped them rise to a place where they can. Beautiful. And we should also, frankly, we should also remember that half the crap they eat around the world was invented and shipped by us. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> I, I won't start naming brands so we don't get sued or something. But, you know, <laughs> you can go down the list of your grocery aisle of how many plastic packaged horrible foods are shipped around the world from us. I hear you, man. So 
I want to be respectful to uh, your time, as I said. And uh, man, I really want to talk orcas with you. You you live on an island named after my favorite animal, and I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if not for a, a pot of orcas that made a surprise visit here. But we will save that for the the next time we get to talk. Gosh, I wish we could talk about uh, that. I have uh, a whole story. It's, it, no. it's too big of a conversation um, to begin. So I, I want to end with this though. Um, Obviously, scientists warn that if we don't take some major actions that you're talking about here soon, we might face a pretty grim future. And uh, I just want to say at the end here, I was so happy to learn that the book that I signed for your daughter made a huge impact on her. So my final question, Kevin, is when you think about your family, your child and the future that we are creating for them, um, how hopeful are you that we can really turn this tide? I'm very hopeful. Um, I shared with you and Steve, one of my fondest memories from my entire life was sitting in the lineup at Seikas, which is the surf spot off of Leo Korea State Beach, uh, with my grandfather and my father. And we were out. It was a big day. And so the third reef was actually breaking. So we were out into the kelp quite a ways. And three bat rays swam under our feet. And we just watched them fly through the kelp. And I was mesmerized, just totally blown away. And it was back then that I had this revelation that, you know, this is really special. This is incredible. Not just that I got to be there with my dad and my grandpa who both served and growing up that way, but how magical that was. And now my daughter, she and I play on the beach. She's been surfing since she could walk. Actually before that, she was on my board. Um, and she is a total ocean warrior, not just a champion. Like it's like, she pulls, calls my BS, you know, she'll just be like, what are you doing? Every time we're on the beach, she'll pick up trash and She's so gonna on. turn you into a vegetarian, man, I know it. <laughs> she probably will, she probably will. So do I have hope, do I have faith? Absolutely. And it's because, it's because the younger generations below us are much smarter and less selfish than we were. There's, there's young women like Greta, um, others are incredible poet laureate. Uh, you know, I mean, like go down the list of how many times we've been inspired in the last year. And for the most part for me, it's been younger people, uh, um, who have really stood up and been passionate. My, my daughter at the Greta climate, uh, rallies had a sign. And I was so she made it up herself. She had this huge sign with crayons on a piece of cardboard. And it said, if you acted like adults, we wouldn't have to. That's it. That's it. Kevin, That's it. I appreciate you. I look forward to the day we can uh, get in the water together. I'll come down here. I'll show you the dolphins and whales. And I definitely want to come up there and uh, be introduced to your magical, mystical orcas. We're going to share the links of everything that you talked about, all the projects that you're focused on. I really appreciate not only your time here today, but just your passion, your heart, your energy, and everything that you're doing for the planet, for your daughter, and for everybody. Kevin Ranker, thank you so much. Rich, I really appreciated the conversation. Thanks for having me on. I look forward to watching your future conversations with other people. And thanks for everything you do. And thanks for that remarkable book that my daughter adored. Thank you, Kevin. That's our show, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thank you.